and welcome to our program where God weeps. A program where we talk about the situation of the suffering church around the world. Since the early 80s, Pakistan has seen the introduction and enactment of various laws that have changed the original pluralistic nature of society that was in its founders' principles. One of the most controversial regulations and mostly misused is the anti-blasphemy law that has become a serious threat to minorities. In 2011, the world was shocked with the news of the assassination of Mr. Shabazz Bhatti, a Pakistani minister who fought to end the abuse of these laws. To know more about the life and work of Shabazz Bhatti and the situation of Christians in Pakistan, it is my privilege to welcome Mr. Paul Bhatti, former Federal Minister of National Harmony and Minorities Affairs. Paul, welcome to our program. Thank you. Paul, we would like to start our conversation sharing with you a short film about the legacy of your brother, Shabazz Bhatti, and the situation of the blasphemy laws in your country, in Pakistan. There's been worldwide condemnation of the murder of Shabazz Bhatti, the only Christian minister in the government of Pakistan. Mr Bhatti is the second senior politician there to be killed for speaking out against the country's controversial blasphemy laws. Pakistani Minister for Minority Shabazz Bhatti has been shot. He'd been visiting family just a short distance away. He refused to go into hiding, though he knew his life was at risk. But in recent weeks, he was concerned about security. He complained that he hadn't been given extra protection in spite of the obvious threat he faced. Born in 1968 in the Punjabi Christian village of Kushpur, one of a few such places on the map of Islamic Pakistan, Shabazz Bhatti was Pakistan's first Christian government minister. We studied in a Christian school, we were living in a Christian village, and uh, we didn't have any problem. But in a government school where the majority of the students is different, he was surprised facing different kind of people who expressed their reservation, like sometimes people are saying they are not allowed to eat with other students. So for him it was very, very strange. He really got angry that this is not human. I met him in the college. He was beaten by the Islamic Jamaat Taliban, the student organization of Islamic radical group. And that was the time they were dominating all the universities and colleges in Pakistan. He was beaten because he belonged to the minority group, to the Christian community. And there he decided that he should raise his voice, that he is Pakistani, he belongs to this society. One day, they formed a group called Christian Liberation Front. He also realized that it has to be wider. That's why he called All Pakistan Minorities Alliance, because that not only spoke of the Christians, it spoke of others who are discriminated in the country, the Hindus, the Buddhists, and others. Introduced in 1985, blasphemy laws continued to remain the biggest source of discrimination. Anyone committing a blasphemous act towards the Quran faces a penalty of life imprisonment. Whereas anyone found to be blaspheming against the Prophet Muhammad 
faces a death sentence. Towards the end of 2008, Shabazz Bati come to please by Bishop Anthony Lobo to accept the nomination of Religious Minorities Minister. Within a short time, he managed to introduce a law guaranteeing minorities a 5% share of public posts, including Parliament. One matter which Shabazz Bati became wholeheartedly involved with related to Azia Bibi, a Christian mother of five children who had been charged for blasphemous acts and accordingly sentenced to death. Open claims of misuse of blasphemy laws led to Shabazz receiving a growing number of threats. When I'm leading this campaign against the Sharia laws, for the abolishment of blasphemy law, and speaking for the oppressed and marginalized, persecuted Christian and other minority, these Taliban threaten me. But I want to share that I believe in Jesus Christ who has given his own life for us. I know what is the meaning of cross and I'm following of the cross. He was definitely a man with a dream, with a vision. That, that we can live together as different religious groups. Shabazz Bhatti possessed a great passion within, a great need to serve his fellow men. He was a very good human being. I believe that we greatly need reconciliation and harmony. We greatly need these values to grow, so that all of us, believers of all faiths, might firstly respect the great people of all faiths. Welcome back to our program. Today, talking with Dr. Paul Batty. He's a former minister of Minorities Affairs in Pakistan and a brother of Shabazz Bhatti. This was quite an impressive uh, short video, you know, few minutes, but we can get an idea of the transcendental uh, importance that uh, his work, his effort had in your country, Paul. I mean, my brother, Shabazz, he dedicated 28 years of his life to bring peaceful coexistence among people of diverse faith, especially between Christian and Muslim. He tried his utmost best to promote religious freedom and especially bring the religious minorities, mainly, unfortunately, Christians belong to the most marginalized and oppressed sector of the society, so bring marginalized sector of the society in the mainstream. So for that, first thing, he was a strong believer and he was having strong faith. And this struggle started when he was 14 years old and he was in the church and it was Easter season and when he was uh, <clears throat> uh, listening to the sermon from the priest, so he was moved by the sacrifice of our Jesus Christ. So he said that uh, he would like to do something for his faith to follow Jesus Christ. The meantime, he observed that there are so many injustices in Pakistan, and especially towards the religious minorities, not only religious minorities, those people who are marginalized and oppressed sector of the society. So as he has experienced several kind of this uh, act of violence against uh, these, men, uh, these people, so on certain moment he decided he, with determination that he would dedicate his whole life to protect these people and to promote religious freedom in Pakistan. And he was great father of founder of Pakistan, Qaeda Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah, who was a great leader and who, I mean, just after the independence, he made a big speech saying that in this country of Pakistan, 
the religion has nothing to stay, see with the state. Politics and religion have two different things. Everybody is free in this country to follow his worship a place, to follow his religion, follow his faith, and state must protect their worship places and give the security of their faith. So that was great I mean, declaration of Kaide Azam, Muhammad Ali Jannah, for the father. Now this was one of the pillars and one of the main reasons for the creation of the Pakistani state. Exactly. And Shabazz took both. One side, it was his own faith to follow Jesus Christ, and the other side, ideology of China. So he dreamed a Pakistan like that, where everybody can live in a free environment, love each other in harmony, honoring the human dignity and faith of each other. But unfortunately, during, the, during his struggle, he has to face a lot of problem from those who want to impose their radical philosophy in Pakistan who want to impose their extreme Islamic ideology in Pakistan. So they were considering him as a threat. In the beginning, he was not considered so, I mean, important because he was young and he didn't have consensus from so many people. But he was almost 20 when he started I mean, contacting the head of state and a lot of big politicians. I think he has some extraordinary a, a capacities and convincing power and which was guided by I mean some ex, uh, I mean extraordinary power like I think it he was guided most of the scene he was guided by God I think because 20 hour of year of age having I mean meetings with a head of states with a big politician and talking certain I mean ideology and surprisingly the, for all of us it was. He was listened. He was listened. And a lot of Muslim people joined him. And he was, I mean, very close friend of uh, our former prime minister who was <clears throat> uh, killed in a, in a terrorist attack, Benazir Bhutto. And Benazir Bhutto called him once and invited him to dinner. We, he was just 22 years old. And she said, I like your, I mean, ideology. I like your, I mean, commitment. And we want to honor you. We want to, I mean, work together with you. And so she, she noticed that, that uh, your brother was uh, working for something that was essential. Yes. For, yes. for the survival of, of uh, the, country uh, the ideal the, Pakistan. Yes, exactly, exactly. And uh, she was, she honored her so much that one day it was a press conference and she honored him, his faith and religion. And next morning, some of the journalists who belong to extremist ideology, they criticized Benazir. And her cartoon was published in the newspaper where she was, I mean, reciting rosary. I mean, they said that she has converted to the Christianism. So there was a real manipulation <laughs> there. In the... yeah. Now, uh, Paul, how come these extremist groups have getting so much power and so much influence? Because you just mentioned uh, that, that some Muslims joined the efforts of uh, your brother Shabbas, meaning that they, they identified with this cause. Yeah. Nevertheless, we see these minorities but extremely powerful, Paul. Why is this happening? I think uh, we have to go a little bit back in the story. Originally, Pakistan was not like that, which we face today. Pakistan was a tolerant country. Pakistan was in some way depicted with the Christian ideology too, because main institution in the country, I mean, hospitals, schools, colleges, they were run by the Christians. And even our present leadership, they studied in a Christian school. So there was good harmony between Christian and Muslims all over the Pakistan. But we had history in the fight against Russian and Afghan in Afghanistan. We had two wars with India. We had the military leadership. And recently, the war against terrorism. So a lot of people manipulated to stop this Russian invasion, to stop this uh, I mean, war against terrorism, to 
stop, I mean, uh, in some way, interference of India, they prepared this jihadi group on name of religion that it was the only way to motivate the people to die and fight for the, uh, for the cause. So they opened and some way there was the West uh, who sponsored such kind of uh, <coughs> campaign at that time. But when the problems were over, this group stayed there. They were a part of routine. A lot of people were giving a lot of money for that. And now they have changed their directions. A lot of people are using them. So these groups extended all over the Pakistan. And now they would like to have their own platform. They would like to have their own money monopoly. And for that, they are going to impose their radical philosophy. For this radical philosophy who is commanding behind them, everybody is in difficulty in Pakistan, not only Christian, but even the Muslim. But the thing is that whenever there is accusation against the Christians, as these people grow up with the anti the sentiment, anti-Christian, like for example, for them, Christians are enemies or other people who are not believers, they are enemies. But do you think that this has been polarized because they associate Western powers, Western invasions with Christianity yeah. and then make, a, make it synonymous with sure, each sure, other? Sure, sure, sure. That's, that is the philosophy behind. That's exactly the same thing that they think the Christians are attached or in some way they spy of the Western world or they're put for the Western world, uh, I mean for the Western world, they, they get in some way connection with, this, uh, with these people. So they are considered enemies. Your brother did a, a lot of, uh, of work against the blasphemy laws. And um, the statistics that I have here, um, they're, they're pretty staggering, uh, Paul, from one accusation, formal accusation in 2011 to 100 in 2014. And now these accusations in terms of blasphemy can go in a very uh, wide variety uh, of terms, you know, going from, they say, uh, misspelling uh, by children uh, about uh, the Quran or the Prophet uh, uh, Mahoma, or um, throwing a card with, with, uh, with a name or, or, in, or something related to, to the prof, Prophet Muhammad. Now, but why, but why is this increased number of uh, accusations of blasphemy? Yeah. Actually, until 1987, there was only one case of blasphemy in Pakistan. After 1987, there were some changes in the blasphemy law, which was made by the that time dictatorship, multi-dictatorship Ziaul Haq. And after he made that uh, changes, people were incited and the blasphemy cases gradually start increasing. And lately, as you have mentioned, they increased a lot and a uh, number of blasphemy cases are directly proportional to the number of extremist group which is growing and extremist ideology which is growing, anti-Western um, sentiment which is growing. So due to several things, like I mean, say, now we have a problem in northern part of Pakistan, we are drone attack there. We have a lot of people who are anti-American. So these people are getting day by day more powerful and they are getting more annoyed with the Christian ideology. So many times it's not the blasphemy, it is just anti-Christian sentiment which is going to find any kind of pretext to attack them. So as unfortunately there is the blasphemy law is one pretext to collect the people that uh, they would not like to listen anything against the holy prophet. So just when something is happening, somebody just announced, oh, he is talking against, uh, um, against prophet and uh, he is a Christian. So based on this already prepared feeling against Christian, then communication of this uh, uh, sentiment or this uh, uh, um, information that he is against prophet, so that inside the people immediately. Paul, this is a, a personal question. Um, have you forgiven your brother's uh, 
murderer? Yeah, uh, actually, you know, when my brother was killed, I was really angry. I didn't like Pakistan. I was not wanted to stay in Pakistan. I was in Italy. I was wanted to take away my mom and all the members of family and go away and say goodbye forever to Pakistan. But I went there, Pakistan. I saw a very moving situation. There was thousands and thousands of people, even from Muslim community, and uh, they were honoring him. They loved him. And uh, President of Pakistan and all these people asked me to continue his struggle. It was very critical for, uh, for me because I was enjoying my professional, I mean, uh, profession in Italy. I had a very good time in job. I was earning very good money. And uh, so I even not thought to do that. So but when I start, I mean, seeing the people start having these people who are concerned, I mean, for their faith in future, who will take care of his mission, I think something starts changing in me. And uh, my mother, she was the ear witness of my brother's death because he was killed just a few meters from my house. And when he was killed, there was a lot of fires of the Clash and Coughs. And my mother was, she didn't know what is happening, but she heard that time. Is, and she saw in the one window and my brother's car was there and he was dying inside. So for me, it was most, I mean, a, a painful moment if I accept this, uh, I mean, responsibility and how will direct my mom when she has lost uh, her son to whom she was living more than 10 years together and every morning. So at that time I went to my mother. So I was afraid to, I mean, share this, uh, my personal feeling. So I am thinking to care carriers. So I was not telling her that I will, she will be hurt because I can imagine, I mean, the situation she was passed through. So, but she very courageously said, Paul, I have forgiven the killers of your brother because they don't know what they have done. Because these are just people who are planning to do that and they don't know what they have done. So I have forgiven. So that was the thing which have moved me. And uh, I thought even Shabazz would have done that because that was the Christian faith. More than all our the things, he was wanted to be a Christian and he was wanted to be known as a follower of Jesus Christ and which is known by his uh, testimony, his speeches, his video channels. So he said his most desire is that he will be honored if the Jesus Christ, for, uh, I mean, accept his sacrifice, sacrifice protecting the religious minorities in Pakistan. So considering that, so I think I don't have other choice. You don't, you don't have a choice, Paul, yes, definitely. Yes, yes. One last question, Paul. What is going to happen now that the, the case of your brother, the case of the, of the governor that defended uh, Asya Bibi, and some other lawyers that have been involved defending these cases of blasphemy, they're killed. So what is the hope? What is the alternative for people that have been wrongly accused of, of uh, uh, blasphemy? I personally think there's a lot of hope. I, I, you see how? Uh, yeah, so I am quite convinced. First of all, I am convinced that the sacrifice of people like my brother or like other will not go in vain. And Jesus has seen that. So I, I am confirmed with that, the sacrifice. So next to that, I see a lot of space in the Muslim community. There are very good Muslim people who want to change the country, who want to defend the Christian people, who want to work together, who want to live together. Even the government people, politicians, uh, I mean, so I was aligned with the Pakistan People's Party, their head I met last week, and she is quite committed. And every time when, I mean, Muslim people, the president of Pakistan, his son, when they're talking about the Pakistan future, he, they're honoring my brother talking that he was the hero of the country. And you know, the president of Pakistan awarded him most courageous award of the country to my brother. So, I mean, seeing all this sympathy, it was not from Christian people, it was from Muslim people and from the people who are in such state to make difference in the country. So I think there is space. So you do know 
personally mm. Muslim people that want to change this abusive situation. Yes, yes. I, I, I have a lot of friends and uh, my brother's case now in the court is defended by the, with my Muslim lawyer and I had defended the several cases of blasphemy with the help of Muslim lawyer. In the cabinet, I have some friends, Muslim politicians, a, who raised why I for Christian people. I'm contacted with several other important leaders who are in complete harmony with us and who want to change the country. So I see the hope. I want to finish our conversation, Paul, without talking about education. Hmm. Uh, do you think that uh, uh, this could be uh, an important element that could make a big change? Education. Yeah, we have to work on several, I mean, front, and education is one of the things that we have to, uh, to work, not only for, I mean, uh, this, uh, to finish the discrimination, to honor the human dignity, because if you have education, you have good opportunity of charm, you are mainstream of the society, you can use your full potential in the society. So to use that, I think this is the basic right of the children to get educated and to express their potential. So that is, a, I mean, hope, and that is, I think, key for the success in Pakistan. Paul, thank you so much thank you. for being with us today. It's my pleasure. Okay. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being with us in another episode of Where God Weeps. If you want to know more about the situation of the suffering church in Pakistan, we encourage you to contact the information at the end of this program. Thank you, and God bless. I